Kwe Kwe, bonjour. Euh, très ravi de vous retrouver ici euh, donc, euh, pour cette euh, rencontre entre Web Caching euh, pardon, et, oui, parfait, <rire> uh, Rice et euh, Julia Caron. Euh, sachez que cette euh, rencontre se fera en anglais. Donc, euh, dès maintenant, je vais nommer le nom des, euh, des commanditaires qui ont appuyé euh, cette rencontre. So this activity is offered by Kwayatank and the Maison de la Littérature as part of the 11th uh, First Nations Book Fair. Etelis presentation in collaboration with Energex Renewable Energy, Hydro-Québec, the Caisse des Jardins of Wendake, and Okatela. Produced by Kwayatong, the 2021 edition is made possible thanks to the financial support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Government of Canada, and Le Gouvernement du Québec. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you. Merci. Uh, as he mentioned, this event will take place in English, but for the question period, if people have questions in French, you can ask them in French and I'll translate them for WAB, if that's all right. And I could translate some of the answers if there's ever anyone who would prefer a little bit of context in French. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here on this third day of the Salon du Livre des Premières Nations. Yeah, third. See some familiar faces, people who've been around at the events already this year for the very special 11th edition of the festival. I'm Julia Caron. I make radio with CBC here in Quebec City. I host the morning show Quebec AM, and I'm a big reader, and I love Indigenous literature, and I've been involved with the festival since about 2013, 2014, and I've had the opportunity to meet some incredible, some of the most remarkable writers working in Canada today, and it's a real honor to be a part of it again this year and to be able to speak with Wab Gijik Rice, who has traveled all the way from his home in Northern Ontario to be here. So without further ado, let me introduce you more fully to Wab Gijik Rice. He is from the Wasaking, Wasak Sing First Nation and Anishinaabe community near Perry Sound. If people don't know where that is, it's near the Georgian Bay region in Ontario. And he lives between there and Sudbury with his family, who we're gonna talk about a little bit. Wab is the author of several books published over the course of the last decade, starting with his short story collection, Midnight Sweat Lodge, which has been translated into French under the title La Cérémonie de Guérison Clandestine, and it follows young people, each visiting an elder at a sweat lodge, talking about their life experiences. His debut novel was published in 2014, called Legacy, which explores how an Indigenous family deals with and, and kind of responds to violence against a young woman in their community. And that was published in French as well, translated and published in French in 2017 under the title Le Leg d'Eva. And his 2018 novel, a post-apocalyptic thriller called Moon of the Crusted Snow. We're going to talk about it a bit. It also has a forthcoming sequel. It was translated into French and published by Mémoire d'Ancrier under the title Neige des Lunes Brisées. I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to talk to Wab about coming all the way here to Quebec City. Wab Gijek Rice, welcome back to Quebec City. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you everybody for coming out this morning. Uh, beautiful venue, just a real honor to be at the festival here, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to our visit this morning. So, Wab, the last time you were in Quebec City was in the sp late spring of 2019. And you have been talking about this book across the country. Uh, since then, you've also had your second child with your wife, Sarah, and another one on the way. You've left CBC to focus full time on your fiction writing. You're one very busy man. Can you tell <laughs> us some of the things that you've been up to since your last time in this city? Oh, yeah. You know, my life has changed a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, being here in 2019 was, uh, you know, one of the highlights of that circuit that I did, you know, sharing the book. It, only, it had only been out for about five or six months by that point. So I think the reaction to it was still um, very fresh and, you know, developing a little bit, I guess. Uh, so it was really exciting for me to be here at that point um, and, and, you know, talking to you and, and some of our CBC colleagues and so on. 
but since then, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I jumped off the mothership, as we say, at CBC, at the big CBC mothership. Um, and yeah, our second son was born in, in June of 2020, and we have another child coming in February. So, uh, but at this point, you know, uh, I've been revisiting this story for, for four years now. Uh, and I didn't expect that at all. And I have just been overwhelmed and very honored by the response to the story. And, you know, learning about how readers have connected with it, you know, from all backgrounds, all walks of life, has just been really rewarding. And it has really taught me the importance and the power of, of sharing human stories. Because in the end, you know, this is a very specific community dealing with a very specific situation. But it's the humanity of all the characters, I think, that gets them through that crisis. And that's what I think people connect with, too. I hope that's what people connect with anyway. That's what I've heard from readers and, and that humanity and seeing yourself in some of the characters and, and the characters are flawed. They make mistakes. They're, they're human. So we see themselves, we see ourselves in those characters. Uh, and for people who haven't read the book, just a brief kind of teaser of the summary, no spoilers. Uh, it starts with preparations for the harsh winter months that lie ahead. Uh, we're in a northern community, an Anishinaabe community, and you know has that kind of push and pull of old technologies and new technologies, uh, and they coexist, but sometimes there's a little bit of tension there, which is really fun to explore as a literary uh, engine. So at one point, the power goes out, and it isn't immediately obvious that something maybe bigger is going on. It's a little ominous. Do you want to take us a little bit on that journey? Yeah, so because this community is uh, farther north, you know, on the land, as, as we say, uh, the people there are, are in transition, as you mentioned, you know, they're, they're um, used to harvesting food from the land, they're used to, you know, collecting wood to stay warm and so on. So when the power goes out, it's not immediately catastrophic for them, you know, they're able to adjust and adapt in the first couple of weeks. But like anywhere, if there's a mysterious crisis, uh, people are going to start to unravel slowly, right? Um, you know, so this community is, I guess, a little bit at an advantage because they have those skills. But at the same time, you know, and we've all experienced this with the pandemic, you know, being very isolated, being very insular. Um, we start to sort of maybe lose it a little bit, right? You know, um, and then this whole situation is upended by the arrival of a stranger from a city to the south. And this is a, a man who is also very mysterious. Um, he has, you know, some very specific skills, um, but he also uh, has some intentions that are a little nefarious that, you know, come to be revealed as he, um, you know, continues to stay in this community and so uh, the community has to decide what they want to do about him and then he's followed up by even more people from the south who are seeking refuge in this first nation um, at the end of the world uh, and yeah so it starts to sort of get a lot more intense after that. The word I've heard a lot of people use to describe that character is just creepy. He's just a <laughs> creepy guy. He's a creepy guy. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the pandemic, Wav, that's super important because this book, you, you wrote this book over the course of a few years. It was published in, in October of 2018, almost five years ago, uh, or almost four years ago, four years ago, not fast forwarding time. So when the pandemic hits, people who read this book, which was a bestseller at the time, really found its audience. And then people were like, whoa, th this is a little prescient. And I don't know if people in the audience remember, in April of 2020, there was a story of two people heading to the Yukon with the idea that they would bunker down and weather through the pandemic by visiting a vulnerable community. This was, we have to remind ourselves, this was pre-vaccines. This was, these were like the first weeks of a global pandemic. And these people went to the Yukon Wob, when you first heard that headline, what went through your mind? <laughs> it was weird. Yeah, I won't lie. I, I, I saw it come up on CBC and, and I thought, wow, this is just bizarre. But not surprising at the same time because I sort of had to um, speculate when I was writing the story about how this would unfold 
if there was a guy who would go to the res for safety at the end of the world, right? And, and going back a few years to, to writing the story, um, that was always going to be a major part of the plot. You know, there's going to be this community that endures this blackout. You know, uh, things start to get a little tense. And then this guy comes in and upsets the balance even more. Uh, and, and as I was writing the first draft, you know, maybe a couple months in, I, I started to really doubt how believable that was. I thought, okay, you know, who is actually going to believe that a, a white guy is going to leave the city to seek refuge on the res? You know, who, who really thinks that way? And, and if nobody believes that, then nobody's going to believe in the story. You know, they're not going to want to read that because it just wouldn't make any sense to them. So I was, I was starting to have like a bit of a, a bit of a crisis, you know, writing the first draft. And my wife and I were living in Ottawa at the time, and we went to a Halloween party. You know, in the fall of the fall of 2015 was when I really started writing the first draft. And uh, we were just hanging out, and because I was writing the story, you know, all I was thinking about was the end of the world all the time, right? So I don't know if I was very fun to talk to at parties because <laughs> that's all that I was bringing up. But I was talking to this guy, the, a friend of one of the hosts. And uh, we started talking about the apocalypse. And, and he said, yeah, man, you know, if, if the shit hits the fan, the first place I'm going is the res. And I was like, oh, yeah, the, the res? Which res? He's like, doesn't matter, man. Whichever one I can get to first. I'm getting my guns, getting my truck, and I'm going to the res. And I, was, I said, oh, yeah, why do you want to go to the res? And he's like, well, you know, I can probably hide out there. And, you know, I know how to hunt, so they'll probably let me stay and stuff like that. And, and I didn't say this to him, but I was like, wow, that's, that's really presumptuous. You know, you think you can just go to the res. But right away, too, I was like, okay, bingo. There was one guy in the world who believes that. So I can keep writing the story, you know. Um, thinking that, okay, maybe he's the only guy in the world. But still, you know, that, that's my reference point. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> So then fast forward to this pandemic moment, and I was like, okay, there's more than one guy. <laughs> there, there's a couple people who think that they'll, they'll, they'll escape too. But, you know, I started thinking a lot more, um, you know, even back to my, uh, in my home community, um, there's been people who've, who've tried to hide out there before. Um, like back in the 1970s, there were some bikers who, who infiltrated our community too. Um, you know, to try to, you know, avoid arrest or something like that, right? So the more I thought about it, you know, the more it, it was realistic. Uh, but yeah, that, that moment was just strange. You know, people, like, would tag me on Facebook and on Twitter, you know, hey, Wob, did you see this about these people who went up to the Yukon? And, and yeah, I just didn't know really what to make of it. Um, it but but it's it sort of at the same time. I wouldn't say it was validating, but I think it was enlightening for a lot of people, too, to see that uh, we're not that far from these desperate measures. You know, it really doesn't take that much for, for us to sort of go to places that maybe we wouldn't have considered in, in, a, in a rational way, you know? So. Truth can be stranger than fiction Absolutely. in many yeah. ways. And you were also invited, if people want to listen back to, you you were invited to talk about it on Unreserved with Rosanna Deerchild, uh, a program on CBC Radio. Um, so it's it was, I, I imagine, validating in the sense that like you could tell your readers really understood what you were exploring if their first thought is, hey, I've heard that story before. So that's, that's fascinating to, to consider and to, and to think about. Um, Wob, as you're talking there about specifically that Halloween party and a guy feeling like a little entitled, you explore a lot about masculinity in your characters and in your writing of these people. What, is, what do you like about that, about exploring different ways of, of courage, of carrying grief, of being leaders, and, and, and also being entitled and and privileged and maybe a little naive at times. What is it that you like about exploring those themes of masculinity in your writing? Well, I think as a man, it's my responsibility to do that, first and foremost. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us, um, you know, of a certain age and older, have been raised with these ideals about what a man should be and how a man should behave and so on. Um, very, I think, rooted in maybe Western ideals or maybe even Christian ideals or, or, or ways of life that I think have become, I guess, the dominant influence, right? 
Uh, and I'm very fortunate in that um, there were a lot of very influential women in my life who raised me. And I think it goes back to um, my father's upbringing. Uh, his father died when he was quite young, when my dad was only about five years old. So my grandmother raised my dad and his siblings, um, seven of them all together, on her own as a single Anishinaabe woman, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, that is, uh, it's mind-boggling to think because those kids would have been ripe for apprehension, you know, to either residential school or the 60s school. But my grandmother was able to really resist that. And, and my dad would say, like, she would tell them, uh, him and his siblings, that, you know, if, if you see a car come onto the res with strange white people, uh, run into the bush, run away. So my dad has memories of, of, of evading capture when he was a little kid, right? Um, but, you know, that really, I think, strong influence of Anishinaabe woman uh, shaped him in, in, in a really powerful way. And, and, of course, that was then passed down to me, and, and then I hope I passed those ideals down to my sons as well. But what that looked like was, I think, you know, a, a profound respect for, for women, obviously. Um, you know, a... a an intention of challenging what some of those masculine uh, ideals are and how they have been imposed upon us as, as Anishinaabe people too. Because traditionally in my community, it, it was the women who were the key decision makers, right? There were men who were in leadership roles, but they always acted upon the advice of the elder women. You know, so in, in you know, the, the contact times or the, the treaty making times or those those trading times, um, the, the women would gather and then say to the men, OK, you tell them this or you um, agree to this or you don't agree to this. And then the men would go and meet with the, the settler authorities. Right. And then once the Indian Act was signed uh, and came into law and the Indian Act system became governance right across the board, um, that really favored men, obviously, right? Because it was a system created by the federal government. And what you saw afterwards were predominantly men who were elected to the chief and council positions that was created by the Indian Act. So it's, it's a very, you know, patriarchal system that was imposed upon indigenous people. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I was raised to challenge all of that. You know, and not a lot of people are, are able to have that, that benefit or that privilege, you know. So I think in that sense, you know, I try to, um, uh, I, I guess, spread that messaging or, or raise that awareness in, in all the work, you know, as, as a journalist when I was at CBC. But especially in, in literature because you have so much more space and, and so much more time to explore some of these themes. Uh, so making Evan, you know, as really kind of an anti-hero um, was one part of that, you know. When, when you look at a lot of post-apocalyptic or, or um, dystopian sorts of stories, there's usually like one hero guy, right? Usually one dude who, who's leading the way, saving the day. Um, but that's not realistic at all, you know. And, that would never happen. And it's it, been done. It's boring. Yeah, it's boring for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for me, like making Evan this sort of quiet leader who, who wants to just do good by his community and lead by example was, I think, a way of, of, of me sort of disrupting those, that toxic masculinity that I think infiltrates basically everything, you know. So. Really well put. I, I really feel that way as I'm reading some of your stories, Wob. Speaking of stories, I teased a little bit at the beginning that you have written a sequel to Moon of the Crusted Snow. The title, can you remind us the title, Moon of the... Moon of the Turning Leaves. Moon of the Turning Leaves. Did you know when you started Moon of the Crusted Snow that you wanted to do a series? No, not at all. When did this sequel like just emerge in you and say like, wow, you've got more to say about these, these people, you've got more to say? when my agent said, I can get you a publishing contract and you can get paid for it. <laughs> no, I, honestly, awesome. that, that, that was it. <clears throat> I, I, I did not intend to, to make a sequel at all when I finished uh, Moon of the Crested Snow. Um, I, I won't give anything away, but quite literally, the end of the story, uh, I saw it as the characters riding off into the sunset, you know, and in, in, a, right. very, in a very sort of like cinematic, typical, yeah, yeah, in a very cinematic way. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm done with them. That's great. I, I accomplished what I wanted to with this story. I'm happy with it. We'll see what happens when it goes out into the world, right? Uh, but I never anticipated the response at all. And with that came interest in a sequel. Well, I, I, it's not true. It wasn't like when my agent said, oh, I'll get you some money to write the sequel. It was, it was readers who really got those, 
the wheels turning for sure. Um, when I started doing like the publicity circuit, you know, going to festivals in like Calgary and Vancouver, um, in those first couple weeks, uh, right away, people who had read it said, you know, this seems like there could be a good sequel to it. Um, are, are you thinking about that? And at first I said, no. And people would get really disappointed. <laughs> so I was like, oh no, I gotta, I gotta lie to them or at least like, you know, stretch the truth a little bit. And, and then I started saying after that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it, but I hadn't really been thinking about it at all. I was just, you know, trying to, to make them feel a little better about, you know, what, what could be a part two. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, you know, the summer of 2019 when my agent said, you know, like the response has been good. If, if you want to explore a sequel, you should really start thinking about it because I can probably get you a publishing contract. Um, so she arranged, uh, it, not until the fall, the fall of 2019, I, I went down to Toronto for a concert and I had some free time in the afternoon and I knew I was going to have some, some time ahead. And, and I said to her, you know, I have some time to kill if, if you want to arrange a meeting or anything, you know, I'm happy to do it. And she did. She arranged a meeting with uh, an editor and a publisher from Penguin Random House. And she said, you know, come with a pitch for an idea for a sequel and, and we'll see what happens. So, uh, you know, at that point I had, you know, wrapped my head around what a sequel could sort of be. And it is essentially 10 years after the end of the first book. So, all this time later, you know, the kids are growing up a little bit, they're teenagers. Uh, this community has stayed in the north. Um, they've created a new settlement away from where they live. Um, they've attempted some exploratory missions to see, you know, who else may be out there, but those missions have failed, um, resulting in, you know, some tragedies. So they've become very, like, traumatized and isolated, still in this new um, beginning for them, you know, post-blackout, right? But eventually they, they realize that they're starting to deplete the resources around them. You know, they're fishing all the fish out of the lakes. The moose and deer aren't coming around as much. Um, they're, they're not getting as many uh, fruits or medicines from the land. So they decide it's time to go. And they go on this essentially summer long quest to the south to see, you know, if the world has in fact ended because they don't know. You know, they've been isolated up north all this time. Uh, but also to reconnect with their original homeland. Uh, because in the first book, it's explained that they originally were on the Great Lakes, but were displaced to far northern Ontario as a result of, you know, settlement. Um, and, and they decide they want to go home. So the story is essentially, you know, a, a quest uh, to the south over the course of the summer. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, how it all started. And, uh, that's exciting. And it will be published in October of 2023. Yeah. So you still have to wait a little bit. There's still a lot of love to, to get that book out into the world. So maybe we'll have you back next year to talk about I hope that so. book. That'd be, that'd be great. It would be awesome. I'm looking forward to really Thanks. seeing where you take those characters. Um, I also wanted to ask about uh, just what you've seen. You mentioned those writers' festivals in Calgary and Vancouver. What has it been like to become a real, I want to say fixture in the Canadian literary circuit where you, you really seem to like going to in-person events and connecting directly with the audience? What is it that you love about that part of the writing world, that face-to-face that -face interaction with, with readers? You do it on Twitter as well. You really have that proximity. What do you, what do you love about that? Oh, it's, it's so energizing. Uh, just being here this morning with you all is, is, is awesome, you know, like I, I appreciate the energy I'm getting from you and I hope, you know, we're having a good visit and that we're, we're all learning from each other. And I think that's what it is mostly, is just, you know, creating relationship, relationships, um, building community, raising awareness. Uh, and, and for me, it's just fun, you know, like you spend all these years working on something and then you're able to share it with the world and, and people appreciate it as they receive it and they have an opportunity to ask you questions about it. And, you know, I, I love that. Like I love going deep into the process or, um, uh, further exploring some of the themes or, you know, talking about the characters or whatever else. Uh, it's really fun. And, and also, like, I, I've really seen a, a change in the last few years um, in how, like, in-person literary events work and how a lot of festivals have prioritized Indigenous voices and how some of the discussions around Indigenous literature have changed, too. Because when I started out, only 10 years ago, when my first book came out, like, there was usually just, like, 
an indigenous panel or an indigenous storytelling event, and that was it, you know. So they'd get all the indigenous writers to this one one hour, uh, you know, slot in the whole festival program. Um, but now, you know, indigenous authors are part of, you know, the more literary discussions, like creating plots or um, developing characters or research, if, you know, those specific discussions that are part of festivals. So it's, it's pretty cool to see. And also there are more and more indigenous authors at these, you know, mainstream festivals too, which is awesome. It's such a great thing to talk about at the Salon du Livre des Premières Nations because I, I know a few people in the audience I've seen at almost every edition that there has been in Quebec and before. A lot of people may remember it was at the L'Hôtel Musée Huron Wendat in Wendage, which was a great opportunity for people to go somewhere where they may have never been uh, invited to visit before. But now we have things downtown, super accessible at multiple events and multiple languages from around the world. I believe, uh, I don't know if Louis Carl is around, but the uh, there was the first pandemic edition of the festival had uh, people from French Polynesia and just like really expanding the idea of like what the appetite is for, for, writer, for readers of all kinds and the genres as well. Like there's such a rich um, like from poetry to um, speculative fiction to memoir, uh, a mind spread out on the ground, like other other books that have really gotten a lot of attention. And yeah, I'm just curious to know more about what you think of that evolution. Do you feel like festival organizers have evolved? Like, I know some writers in the past have been like, okay, yes, I'm invited because they just need to check a box. <laughs> do you still feel that that's, do you feel hopeful that that's evolving, That that we're getting away from some of the tokenism that has existed in the past? I think so. Uh, and um, I think festival organizers are, are sort of uh, adapting with, uh, adapting to what readers want. Because if you look at bestseller lists, you know, you, you see a lot more indigenous authors on bestseller lists now. Or the short lists for the big literary prizes or, or the long lists, you'll see indigenous names on that as well. So the readers, I think, people who are buying the books in Canada are, are really helping to drive that change too. Um, because Canadians are seeing books as a good way to um, fill in those awareness gaps, you know. Um, and, and there are generations of Canadians that really didn't learn much at all about Indigenous people, you know. Uh, or what they did learn was from white writers. Yeah. Like, I'm thinking of Julia Among the Wolves and, like, some of the cliches yeah, that I read. Two Against the North and, and stuff exactly. like that, yeah. And it was written by white people, and these white children are being told, these are Indigenous stories, yeah. but they're written by white people. Yeah, yeah. Well, even like when I was a kid on the res, you know, we would, we read Two Against the North as like a story that was about indigenous characters. And, you know, it, it's weird looking back thinking that, you know, that was the only thing that was accessible to us, you know? Well, what, it, well who was the author of that one again? Far, Farley Mowat. Farley Mowat. Yeah. Are people familiar with, uh, Farley Mowat is very well known in English uh, speaking Canada and was on the curriculum for, I think, a lot of elementary schools. And I think he was from Newfoundland. I can't remember where he's from. I can't yeah. remember, but he was a best-selling Canadian author for a good chunk of the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s and uh, very well-loved. And those types of conversations are quite different today. Mm. Um, you also mentioned something that, that I'm, you know, it's early in the morning. I've, I'll follow my train of thought. It, may, <laughs> it might come back. Um, oh, yes, you mentioned literary events, galas, jurors. You were recently a juror for the 2022 Giller Prize, and also, as you mentioned, all of, all of the authors, the five books that were in the running for the Giller Prize this year were all written by people of color, mm -hmm. uh, black people, uh, queer, it, it was the first year uh, a queer person won the award. Suzette Meyer won for the Sleeping Car Porter. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what that process was like being on the jury for the richest literary prize in Canada. It's $100,000 mm -hmm. as a prize to one book. Mm -hmm. What was it like to go through that process of reading those books, of, of having those weighty discussions about who deserves this mm -hmm. recognition? It was awesome. It, it was, you know, a life highlight for sure. Awesome. Um, just spending a year reading all these books, talking with really brilliant people, you know, uh, much more experienced than me in the literary world. Um, I learned a lot for sure, not just by reading all the books, but by talking with the jury. And um, really, I think 
homing in on on uh, the the long list and then the short list was a really cool process. Uh, it was intense for sure. Like we had a lot of really um, strong discussions. It was never like volatile at any point. Uh, I, we were all very amicable with each other, um, and I think we all had our uh, our favorites for sure that we wanted to champion. But there was no um, you know firm objective criteria that we were ever presented with. Or there was never any, I think, um, proclaimed uh, criteria that we individually um, set forth to the others. You know, basically, we just wanted to uh, reward the story that was the best written, you know? And I think having, you know, authors of color, you know, dominate the shortlist in the end was very organic because we didn't set out to do that. It was just kind of like in the end, we're like, oh, wow, you know, these are all uh, people of color. And also like when we when we got the long list together, which was 14 books, um, most of them were books by independent publishers. And and we didn't yes. we, we didn't intend that either. We we're just like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool uh, because we were just focused on the stories themselves. And I think that's, you know, you'll have like these these trolls or these blowhards on social media who'll say, oh, you know, the, this is like a, a woke uh, or, you know, using woke as like a pejorative, right? Uh, you know, as it to, to sort of discredit what's going on in terms of, you know, um, uh, representing, you know, diverse voices in, in whatever industry. Um, and, and of course, like all five of us, you know, value that for sure, but we didn't, set that forth as, as a priority for us. We're just like, we just want to, you know, highlight the best stories that were the best written. And it just so happened that most of them on the long list were by independent publishers. And then on the short list in the end, they were all authors of color. So it was sort of a nice, nice surprise. Um, but like, I think, you know, it's sort of testament to just the good stories that are out there, you know, from diverse communities um, and how important it is for all of Canadian readers to really recognize that. I also have to ask you about the beautiful bolo tie that you wore to that <laughs> event. It was black tie, everybody looked fabulous, including your wife, Sarah. Can you tell us about the beaded uh, Thunderbird? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> well, I, I knew I had to wear a tux and, and like, I don't really like getting dressed up that much, you know? <laughs> I'd wear like a t-shirt to something like that if I could. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to sort of represent somehow. So I asked um, a, a friend of mine who lives in North Bay, Ontario, named Crystal Simaginus, uh, to, to be something for me. And, and I, I, you know, just decided on a, a very basic Thunderbird design, which is a symbol of the Anishinaabek Nation. Um, so yeah, having it, you know, front and center, you know, where my tie is was, was kind of cool because I knew I was going to be doing that opening on the broadcast. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just a fun way to represent it. You looked fabulous. Thank you. And it's it's just also nice, like you say, to find something that reflects you yeah. when something might be a little bit, you know, a little hoity-toity yeah. in some ways. <laughs> yeah, let's sure. let's let's be clear. Um, I want to talk. You mentioned uh, a little bit about what you love about talking about writing, sharing about writing. For people who don't uh, use Twitter, uh, Wob is very active there and shares a lot of his thoughts and interactions with young writers as well. And recently, uh, or maybe not so recently, but at one point you shared a piece, I believe that was published in the Globe and Mail, which was something about memory, oral storytelling, and writing. I'm going to quote you. The biggest thing we have is our memory. And you, you talk about that responsibility of listening. You have to listen differently if you know you can't go back and read it later. You're, you're hearing it. You had to listen and remember everything you heard. Can you tell us more about how that informs your writing practice? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <clears throat> it's, it's a pretty huge discussion, I think, especially amongst Indigenous writers, when it comes to, you know, documenting our experiences, but also incorporating traditional oral storytelling into, you know, the literary process, you know, writing it down, having it live in a book, you know, for as long as a book is in print. Um, I think attitudes have changed around that, which is really good, and that's sort of a separate discussion. But uh, the oral component of it is, is really what I think informs me as a writer. And I, when I wrote that piece for the Globe and Mail, it, it was really, uh, like, 
I'll just give you the b whole backstory about it. I was starting to write the first draft of Moon of the Turning Leaves. This was, you know, two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, right after I left CBC. And a friend of mine from Perry Sound, Ontario, um, had these videotapes, these VHS tapes that he, he gave me a while ago. And, uh, you know, nobody has a VCR anymore, right? So <laughs> I couldn't watch them readily. And I had them for about two or three years. And finally, I had some time because I, I had quit CBC um, to get them digitized. So I took them to a guy in Sudbury who put them on, you know, a digital file for me. And these were tapes of an elder from my home community named Fred Wheatley. And Fred was a really interesting guy. He was one of the storytellers that I grew up with. You know, he would always come into our school on the res and share stories with us about, you know, our culture, um, our community history, and so on. And, and his background is, is just fascinating. Like, he was apprehended to go to residential school, and he, he lost his language while there. Um, he came back uh, in his teen years, and his mother retaught him the language, like, which is just, you know, it, speaking of the power of, of the matriarchs, like, that's just a, an awesome example of that, right? So he became this really uh, revered elder in our community. Uh, and he died in, in the early 90s, um, you know, huge loss, obviously. But on these tapes were these uh, visits with Fred. Um, he was speaking with some uh, elementary school students from Perry Sound and from Wasoxing. And he was just telling stories about our people and, and about, you know, um, you know, stories about the bush, you know, why a tree is called that or why a muskrat does this and so on, right? And it was really cool to watch these videos because it just brought me back to my childhood, you know. It, it was a way to reconnect with him, even though he's been gone for like 30 years now, right? But what he said at one point was, you know, what I'm doing here is, is telling you these things in order for you to remember them. And I want you to go to your family or to your peers after and tell them the same stories. Keep repeating it because the more you repeat it, the more it's going to be, you know, tattooed onto your brain for the rest of your life. And that's really, I think, the, um, I guess, the general thesis of, of oral storytelling is the more you repeat something, the more you're going to remember it, right? And at that point, I just quit my job as a journalist, which I'd been doing for like almost 20 years. And, and I thought, you know, like, I can remember all those stories he told me when I was a kid. I, I can repeat them to my kids effortlessly. But if I try to remember the stories I did as a journalist, like, I don't really remember them, you know? Because, you know, you're reliant upon documentation as a journalist. You know, you write them down, you put them in a radio story or write them for the web or, or TV or whatever else. And then they're sort of gone from your memory after that, right? Um, because you're reliant on that documentation. You're like, okay, it's being written down. I don't have to commit this to memory anymore. Uh, and, and it was really revealing for me. And I thought, oh man, like I gotta, I gotta get back to that essentially. I, I got to keep repeating these stories, you know, out of my mouth into ears rather than just writing them down. So I tried to, to incorporate that into my writing process too. Like before I sit down to write a draft, I, I feel like I should be able to tell the whole story to somebody. You know, if Julia, if you and I, you and I were sitting down and you said, okay, tell me your whole sequel. Um, I feel like I should be able to do that before I write it down. So, um, so for me, that, that's been a key part of the process. And I have a friend uh, who's an author in Toronto, his name's uh, Naben Ruthnam, and he says, like, he will, like, <laughs> when he's writing his novels, he'll, he'll say, it, say it out loud, all the words. Um, he'll speak it as he's writing it, right? And, and I think that's a really good process, too, uh, because also, like, you're going to have to read them in public eventually, <laughs> so you got to make sure you know how to pronounce the big words, especially if you're going to write them in there, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, I, you know, the, the, I think it's all of us can benefit from that, you know, just spending time with each other and telling stories. And we all do that on a daily basis. You know, it, it becomes this sort of um, almost a trope that Indigenous people are all oral storytellers and, and that's our way of life. But it's everybody's way of life. All cultures around the world are rooted in oral storytelling. You know, we've only had mass-produced printing materials for about 600, 700 years, right? So we all have it in us, and, you know, I, I just encourage everybody to harness that. That resonates so deeply for me as someone. I, I started as a journalist writing in print and then eventually found my way to radio and 
just so much of what you said there and when you're writing down every note and you want to make sure you're quoting something accurately are you really actively listening to all of the nuance and all of the complexity of a story and you have a deadline and and I mean you've hosted a radio show as well you know like just this week someone asked me how many interviews did you do this week and I did 32 live interviews from Monday to Friday Wow. and so if you ask me to repeat that it's not the same, and also it's it's by phone or, or FaceTime yeah. or something. You're not face to face. You're not having that proximity. So this, there's a lot there. I could go on and on about just that topic, <laughs> but I want to make sure we have time to hear from the audience if people have questions. So I'll open the floor to questions now. And again, si jamais vous préférez poser la question en français, je peux traduire pour Wab. Et Alex has the wonderful microphone. If anyone wants to break the ice. Um, learning, hello. Hello. Good morning. So learning all these stories hard to, by heart, uh, was it given by a sense of responsibility to transmission as well? Because this is uh, proper to indigenous. Here we, we receive story, stories all the time, but we don't feel the need to learn them because they are all around them, uh, all around us. But when you receive uh, your digital or, or VHS thing, it's, uh, it, it, is it like with this responsibility that comes with it to transmit and to keep the knowledge for the, the coming generation? Oh, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, if, you know, having that, that those tapes come into my possession, you know, I shared it with my community once I digitized it, right? But also, like, I, I, I listened to the stories again, and then I told them to my kids after, you know? Uh, so, and, and, you know, I think it's a good opportunity now to touch on, like, the, I guess, conflict of, of writing things down or recording them. You know, like, 20, 30 years ago, uh, some, some elders or some traditional knowledge keepers would, would say, you know, you should not write anything down. You should not record anything. You know, that's not our way. We have to speak these things to each other and we have to pass them down because that's the way it's been done for, for thousands and thousands of years, right? But I think, you know, more widely, people are understanding how crucial it is to record these things regardless and, and document them. Um, because in a lot of ways, like in my, in speaking for my community only, uh, we only have about you know four or five first language Anishinaabe speakers um, left, elders who were raised speaking only Anishinaabe, right? Um, and and you know if we don't record them speaking that way, um, that's going to be gone forever. You know that that is, and and I don't want to sort of purport to have any sort of language expertise at all. I'm not a fluent speaker, and th this is only my opinion. Um, but you know, having that that archive, I think, is essential. And then you know that can sort of, um, I guess, translate to to literature, or to other art forms, or whatever else. You know, incorporating some of that traditional knowledge is really is really important. Having it live in, in different ways, uh, I think, is, is definitely a responsibility that we all have. For sure. Yeah, keeping it alive, absolutely. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you for the question. It's really important. Good morning. Uh, it's been really nice. Really nice. It's always so nice coming here and just, just <laughs> It really, listen. really is. The vibe, if I could use the word, is, is so warm and, and so much learning to be, to be done. So thank you both. Thank Julie, you. you do a great job. Um, so I'm just curious, Wob, to know, like following up on that subject, just as a, you know, as a, as a, I'm a farmer, I'm, I'm off on the farm all on my own, you know, for so many years, decades. Um, so it's, it's just a really simple but honest question. Um, I just kind of wonder, you know, clearly there was an evolution time. There, evolution is a fact of life. And you're at the point now in your community where there's four speakers who, who spoke that language uh, all the way to their, to their elder status. I'm just wondering where is the evolution at right now linguistically in your community? You've got young people coming along, you're mm. not a fluent speaker. Mm. I'm just curious to know, and, and maybe even into the future of the evolution, um, where is it going? That's a great question. Well, there's a greater desire now uh, to learn 
um, when I was younger, you know, in the 80s and 90s, uh, it wasn't prioritized at all. And, and that's because of, you know, some of the shame that was, you know, imposed upon people connected with the language. You know, I heard the language spoken around me all the time in my community, but never, it wasn't often directly spoken to me because, you know, the, the elders were, were led to believe that in order for your children to survive or to thrive in this world, that's not the language for them anymore. They got to excel in English. And those attitudes were prevalent for a really long time. And I don't blame anybody in my community or in my family for me not being fluent at all. Uh, it's, it's a result of colonialism, right? It's a result of oppression, of, of you know, it, it was a legal effort on behalf of Canada to wipe out these cultures, you know, and these languages and so on. But now, you know, the young people are really uh, working hard to try to learn on their own. Um, what's happening is, uh, you know, what's called language nests are, are popping up in a lot of communities. So what that, ha what that does is it brings elders and children together, like infants, so that infants can hear the language around them spoken, you know, fluently, so that they absorb it, right? Because those are the key times for, for infants to really learn language. And it's really cool to see that happen. It's happening in, in my community, too. But still, in the end, you have the, these wide gaps within the sort of the people my age, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on, uh, who, who just don't have those same opportunities. So hopefully, you know, there will be uh, uh, more resources. And, and I think it's the responsibility of the federal government to fully fund immersion programs, language nests, uh, for people of all ages to learn their language fluently because the federal government is responsible for damaging and destroying indigenous languages, right? Like, if you want to talk about reconciliation, in my opinion, that's what it looks like. It looks like restoring language, you know? Uh, so there's, uh, as mentioned, there's, there's a greater wish to, to learn language more, more so than when I was a kid, right? So I'm encouraged by that. Um, I just hope that the people who want to learn can be supported, you know, and, and they have the capacity to do that as, mu as much as they want, you know. If that means, like, being able to uh, learn your language as, like, a full-time job, then I think that's great, you know. That's what real immersion looks like. So we'll see. We'll leave it at that. Uh, WAB will be available for book signings at the Morin Centre this morning, and you have other conversations and other events coming out throughout the festival if you want to have a look at the program for the dates, times, and locations. Thank you, everyone, for your, your attentiveness. Merci beaucoup pour votre écoute, and thank you very much to WAB. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.